Great to have you back here on The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Our next conversation, or our major, first major conversation this morning, is going to be on the NSAS panel report. The Vice President and, of course, the NEC has uh, you know, set up a committee that will look into the reports and the findings from the NSAS panel. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, is uh, uh, chairing that panel. And, of course, uh, Nigerians are looking forward to whatever these findings are and what levels of implementation would be entirely necessary. What reforms also will be um, uh, needed and would uh, will immediately put to work, immediately these uh, findings are released. So we're speaking this morning with uh, Nick Agule, who's joining us from the UK. Uh, good morning and thanks for joining us, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much. Nice to be here always. Yeah. All right. So the, the uh, panels across the country, of course, have been going on for months now. Some of them have been, you know, reasonably successful and others, you know, seem to have been dragging their feet. There's, uh, I think, in Kogi State, the, you know, panel never even sat uh, for any day. But there's been findings, there's been deliberations, there's been, you know, some of them, of course, conclusions with uh, regards compensation for victims of uh, SARS brutality and, and uh, the likes. Um, as the panel report is meant to be released and uh, for sent to the vice president, where do you think the major focus would be on from the vice president? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's actually uh, heartwarming to know that states actually set up panels and the panels sat and some of the states, the panels have already concluded their work and they have uh, written their reports. I will say kudos to all those states and the panelists and those who appear before them because it is a step in the right direction. And now that the reports uh, in some states are ready, it is also a step in the right direction for the vice president to convene a meeting to look into this report. So it shows that this is not the usual way of setting up panels and the reports, we never hear about the reports. Or when the reports are released, they are not uh, implemented. So we hope that the vice president will follow through with the reports of these panels and implement the recommendations. All right, Mr. Agule, I need to ask you um, about this, you know, reports that we've seen. Um, first of all, the key thing is that we need police reforms. I mean, that's been glaring from the get-go. So what sort of reforms do you think we need to um, see in the Nigerian police force? Well, the, there are short-term, medium-term and long-term reforms. In the short-term, meaning what needs to be done immediately, is for the Nigerian police as currently constituted to be empowered. And when I say empowered, they should be empowered on different fronts. First and foremost, their training as a police organization, they need ongoing training of their personnel in their duties of law enforcement. And law enforcement is better if it is preventative. So prevent crime from taking place and not chasing after crime. So there is that training aspect of the police to see their duty as people who prevent crime. So there should be a lot put into crime prevention more than crime fighting. And also, they need equipment to do their work. I mean, we, we, we see the kind of rickety vehicles, you know, that our police use. We see the kind of uh, uh, barracks or residences where they live. 
I mean, there's a video recently of a police officer, you know, complaining that his transfer allowances have not been paid since he was transferred to a new location. So those are the kind of things in the short term that government needs to look after as well. In the medium to long term, and this conversation has occupied national attention for a while, we need to look at our policing. You don't find nations that have national police like we have in Nigeria. Police is pretty much local. In the UK where I am now, we're not even talking about policing at local government level. You are looking at policing at city level. So London, where I'm sitting now, they have their police force. And if you go to the next city, they have their police force. So we should not even be talking about Lagos State Police. We should be talking about Ikeja Police, Ikorodu Police. And these police are not reporting to any Inspector General of Police at the National. These police are reporting to the mayor of Ikeja to the mayor of Ikorodu, funded and commanded by him. That is the kind of policing that we need in Nigeria, a policing that is local, a policing that understands the terrain, a policing that is distributed across the country. We currently have a national police with a single inspector general of police who reports to a single a boss, the president of the country. The inspector general of police in Nigeria is not doing his work very well. That means the entire policing system in Nigeria is not going to be effective. So we've put all our eggs in one basket. But if we took policing to be local, and you have Ikeja police, and then you have Ikorodu police, you will discover that all over the country, there will be a lot of the police commands that will be effective, you know? So this is one thing that we need. We need policing to be taken away from the national down to the local so that, you know, uh, uh, policing is, 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 is brought close to the people. And what? also, like here in the UK, you have specialized police. So Heathrow Airport, which is just here around the corner from where I'm sitting, they have their own police. And the police in Heathrow Airport, that is their job. When they join the police, they, are, they, they know how to police an airport. It's not as if tomorrow you will transfer an officer from somewhere, you know, and then say, go to Heathrow. No, 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 no. These people, their job is to police an airport from their first rank to the highest rank. Even institutions like universities have their own police. So at the end, when you have policing distributed like this, it becomes more effective. So these are the kind of things that we need to be touching on in All terms right. of making our policing to work in Nigeria. Well, you know, some of the things that you mentioned um, um, might be a, a stretch, you know, seeing, you know, the issues that we currently have with funding, um, uh, the Nigerian police as, it's, as it currently is. Um, but I, uh, something I want to ask, the conversation this morning, you know, and the necessity of uh, police reforms in Nigeria, uh, the issues and the challenges the police have had, you know, they've had them for a very, very long time. Do you think that the NSAS panel report would be enough motivation for the Nigerian government to look uh, deeper and take these uh, necessities more seriously? The, the end panel, the NSAS panel reports, I, I'm not privy to what's in the reports now, but I can imagine that the reports will include, amongst other things, a reform of policing in Nigeria. And I will expect that the vice president, who is leading government's efforts in this direction, to see this recommendations true. I mean, time is no longer on his side because uh, the current government has less than two years to leave office, but they can start the process. Like they can start the process of constitutional amendment. I mean, I was describing policing 
local to the to the level of local government we might not go uh like you said that to that extreme but at least we can start by taking policing down to the state level so that each state funds and oppress their policing system so i i expect the the the, the vice president uh to follow through with these recommendations which will then uh, transform into re into reforms into the reform of of our entire security architecture and not just the nigerian police there are other uh you know security agencies in nigeria that equally need to be reformed so that we can have security without security every other effort of government we come to naught, as we are seeing right now in Nigeria. Sadly, some of the things that you've mentioned, and, and some of them, you know, including state policing, um, might have to go with the same conversation uh, that many Nigerians are having now with regards to restructuring. Um, and, of course, you are aware of the Nigerian government's stand with regards to restructuring and being able to let go of uh, some of these agencies and, be, and uh, let uh, states have uh, control of their security uh, forces full control. Uh, so do you think that might also become a hindrance, uh, seeing the government's attitude towards some of these conversations? Um, initially, this government was not favorably disposed to discussions about restructuring in terms of uh, the policing. But uh, in recent times, I have been hearing conversations uh, from the presidency and, and the states, including some of the governors on the ticket of the ruling party who are now speaking in favor of uh, uh, the devolution of powers, including policing. So I believe that there is, uh, there, the, the, the government has come to that realization that this, some of these discussions, because you see, the thing is that when we talk about restructuring, uh, some people try to give it a correlation, which is something close to secession. And that has been giving restructuring a bad name. Uh, but if you look at restructuring in terms of what we're speaking about, which is the federal government looking at the 68 items on the exclusive list in the constitution of the federal republic and releasing some of those uh, those uh, items on the exclusive list to the states and local government which includes policing i think is a good thing and the, the current government is now favorably looking to that uh, to that to that direction what needs to happen is uh, our constitution needs to be amended. So these are the kind of things that should engage the, the, the National Assembly who are currently in the process of amending the constitution to release things like policing to the states so that we can now begin to have funding and running. Because you see, the advantage is that if we release policing to the states, and a Kaduna State Police might be more effective than FCT Police. You know, Lagos State Police might be more effective than Ogun State Police. But at the end of the day, we are going to have pockets of effective police uh, forces around the nation. And then they begin to form a standard of comparison of other police forces. You know, because let's, let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the numbers. The, the, the Metropolitan Police that is currently policing me, where I'm sitting now, in London, in the city of London, their annual budget is about four billion pounds. They have over 44,000 police officers just to police this city. The New York Police Department, which is funded by the city of New York, their annual budget is $6.5 billion. They have nearly 40,000 police officers policing the city of New York. Let us put that in comparison with Nigeria. The entire Nigerian police force of 36 states and the FCT, the total budget allocation in the 2021 uh, federal government budget is 400 billion naira. 
if we translate 400 billion naira into dollars, it's less than one billion dollars. So the entire Nigeria is funding the, the police with less than one billion dollars. And New York is funding police with 6.5 billion dollars. How can Nigerian police be effective with that kind of funding? Because let's not forget, it is the same vehicle that the New York Police Department will buy, that the Nigerian police will buy. They are all buying vehicles from the same market. So just look at in comparison, you will discover that the, the, the funding of the police is so abysmally poor that there is no way we can get anything useful out of that kind of policing system. You can't give what you don't have. But if we devote police to the state, and each state is now putting a budget aside for policing, if you aggregate that budget, it will be far more than the budget that the federal government is committing to policing today. So that is going to be a distinct advantage to us by the federal government releasing, devolving powers such as policing to the states. Okay, Mr. Agule, in addition to, you know, funding the police for them to buy all the necessary equipment that they need, um, would you also um, talk about their salaries? Because I personally have interviewed um, some policemen. And they told me their salary is just 50,000, 60,000 naira for all the work that they do. And, you know, this also, in a way, embodies corruption, doesn't it? And that is all part of the funding discussion. Because a properly funded police force will not only equip the officers to discharge their responsibilities, it will also take care of the welfare of the officers. The reason why, I mean, one of the best paying jobs in London, we are speaking to you now, is the police. One of the best paying jobs in the UK is policing. So when you see a police officer, well paid, well maintained. You know, even you, you, your mind will not make you to go and start offering him a five pounds bribe. Because you, you look at him, you know that this guy is just is going, is going to take you to the cleaners. These guys are driving uh, BMWs as their official cars that they are using in chasing people around. So if we adequately fund the police, they are going to get the equipment they need. They are going to be paid well. There is no reason why the lowest paying police officer in Nigeria should not be going home with 250,000 naira for a start. There's no reason why. There's no reason why you go to the police barracks and, and, and you, you think you are in some sort of slum. And then there's one other thing that is very crucial in terms of funding the police. Here in the UK, we are speaking to you now. All of us, the over 60 million UK citizens are also engaged in policing work. How do I mean? The government has provided us an emergency number, 999, okay? When we see something that looks as if it is a criminal activity either to happen or is happening, we pick our phones, we, that means we have become police informant or kind of pseudo police officers. We pick our phones, we call, and then the police respond to that incident immediately. As simple as something like that, Nigeria doesn't even have it. Nigeria does not have an emergency number. I hear there is, uh, is it 211 or something, but it's not effective. Nigeria needs to spend small money and put in place a command and control center with an emergency number that is linked on every GSM network. So that when citizens see a crime about to happen or is happening, they just call the police and the police respond quickly to that crime scene. Well, I think I Not think the I think current Nigerians... situation where the police will go and mount roadblock. Yeah, um, when they mount Mr. roadblock. They are only policing that place where they have mounted roadblock. There is no response system if crime is happening in the next street. Mr. Agula, so I, I think all of this that needs to change. I think all of this still goes back to dividend. the conversation on funding because you know, Nigerians once in a while still make those calls, you know, to, uh, to police numbers in different states. 
but it's the ability to respond to those uh, uh, calls that is the challenge. Uh, sometimes there's no petrol in vehicles, sometimes you need to mobilize them, um, you know, and different reasons. Uh, sometimes, of course, they come, you know, two hours after the um, um, uh, incident has taken place. Um, it still goes back to the conversation on uh, funding, uh, being able to invest more in information technology, invest more generally in technology to help with uh, policing in Nigeria. Um, some other part, you know, that I feel uh, we have, you know, been lacking for a long time is the levels of accountability and punishment for airing officers. Um, it's one of the reasons why uh, there, of course, was the NSAS protest in the first place. Uh, the fact that policemen went um, um, rampage across the country, uh, SARS officers went rampage across the country and were committing crimes without getting punished. So how do you think that this panel report and the vice president will be able to create uh, more conversations on accountability and punishment for airing officers? It's a very good point that you have raised. And it is one of Nigeria, I mean, to me, it is Nigeria's singular problem. The lack of accountability. We are not enforcing the law. We are not holding people to account. I mean, anywhere in the world, if human beings realize that they can do something wrong and they can get away with it, they'll probably do it. The reason why I will probably not beat the traffic light if I leave my home now is because I know there's a camera mounted on the traffic light. And if I beat it, I'm not going to be let free. Uh, the, 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 the repercussion of my action is going to, to start chasing me about within a few days. So that is one thing that in Nigeria we have to start to do. We don't have problem with laws. We have all sorts of laws. Nigeria is a country with so many laws. The problem is enforcement of these laws. If someone goes contrary, to the laws of the land, he has to be held account for it. He has to be brought to justice. And we are not seeing that. We are not seeing that, like you rightly said, amongst not just the police, but other law enforcement agencies in Nigeria. We have, we have seen the, uh, cases of human rights abuses that have gone uh, unpunished. And it's the same thing that happens in even uh, in official cycles, like in government offices where people can take money that is meant for the provision of essential services to the citizens and nobody does anything to them. We, we, we are in, in a country where someone's salary as a director probably or a permanent secretary or a minister, we know what the salary is and they are clearly living above their means. And there is no system that goes after them to say, look, you explain to us how you come about this money. So that is a very key ingredient in our law enforcement uh, apparatus to say we have to and, and and that goes back to the conversation that i was saying some of these things are coming from training you know you have a culture an organizational culture a young police officer who joins the police today if he comes into a culture where you know you can slap people you know you can harass people you can molest people and nothing happens is most likely going to adopt that culture. So we need to retrain our officers so that they, they, they understand that policing is no longer what it used to be. That hu people's human rights have to be respected all the time. So it's a very good point that you have raised. And I believe the vice president, uh, part of his, uh, his uh, terms of reference in implementing this uh, reform should include the fact that Policing, police officers have to be held to account for their actions. All right. I'm still talking about police reforms regarding the NSAS protests. During that period, you know, people came up to say that SARS officials picked their brother, their friend, and they have been in police custody for months. You know, I also had, um, you know, people that I knew within, you know, the SARS and they, you know, go ahead to tell me stories about how they arrested so-and-so person and the person has just been languishing there because maybe the parents can come up with the money that they're asking for to bail the person. So one of the police reforms uh, regarding the NSAS protests, would you say we need to overhaul, you know, some laws guarding policing um, to say that if the law specifies that a person should not be held within a few hours. That should be what it is, rather than the police officer having the power and authority 
to keep someone in police custody for months on end until the family can bring money. It's another very solid point that you have raised. And I think the solution is not in the overhaul of the law. The laws are already there. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I think we have a law that says if you arrest someone, there is a time limit. Is it 24 or 48, 48 hours? hours. I, I, can't, I can't remember. That you must either charge this person to court or release them. So it's back to the question of enforcement of our laws. If we have that kind of law, and then someone is, is arrested and for months or even years, they are in detention, they are, they've not been charged to court, and they have not been released, then the people who are responsible for such human rights abuses should be held to account. That is what we need. It, it, it's just for people whose job is to enforce the laws, to enforce them. So if, they, if, a DP, if a DPO is not enforcing the law, then the area commander should enforce the law. If the area commander is not enforcing the law, then the commissioner of police in that state should enforce the law, or the AIG of that zone should enforce the law, or the IG of police should enforce the law. And if the IG of police is not enforcing the law, the president, who is his commander-in-chief, should enforce the law. Until we start enforcing the law, we cannot get anything out of humanity. Humanity was made to be run by the law. The, the, the God who made humans, you know, as, as the manufacturer of humans, he has given us a template to run humans. And that template is the law. If you don't run humans with the law, you are not going to get the best out of humans. That's what it means. I mean, there was a recent picture or a, a viral video recently of a diplomat, a whole diplomat from one of these Western nations. He stood on the highway and he was easing himself. You know, that is, but that man can't do that in his own country. But then he goes to a country where the law is not being enforced and he's doing it. So that is humanity for you. The same Nigerians you see in Nigeria breaking the law, you bring them to the UK and they will be obeying the law. You know, they are not doing the kind of things they were doing in Nigeria. So you can see that it has nothing to do with our Nigerianness. It has everything to do with the system where we are. So if a Nigerian is in a system where the law is being enforced, like in the UK, he obeys the law. If he's in Lagos, where the law is not being enforced, he doesn't obey the law. So we just have to enforce the laws. There has to be a system to enforce the laws and if the people we have elected into office are not enforcing the laws, we, the people who elected them, have to force them to enforce the laws. All, All right, right, Mr. Nikawuli, we, we do agree. We need uh, police reforms. All right, thank you very much sir, for joining us this morning. We hope you do have a great day. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Okay. So regarding police reforms. I really can't wait to see, you know, what exactly would be the outcome of that meeting when they uh, meet to dis consider, because that's the word they use, will consider uh, implementing the... the recommendations? Uh, yes, the resolution. Well, there's people who said, you know, it's just playing to the gallery. Um, and, you know, so I think it's one of the reasons I asked the very first question, or second question, I believe. Um, for a long time, we've known that we have these issues. It's not just because of the NSAS protest. The NSAS was probably just the boiling point um, um, in 2020. Um, there's very, you know, still possibilities that there might be another boiling point, you know, you know in the future, where people say enough is enough with regards to um, uh, police issues or security issues. Um, but we've known about these things for a long time. Um, at what point uh, did we need to get to the you know, NSAS protest before the Nigerian government realized the lapses in the police system. And so is, is the uh, report of that panel going to be enough motivation for the Nigerian government to say, okay, yes, maybe we I, actually I want need to, to believe so. I, I, I want to believe that the NSAS protest and the judicial panels of inquiry are not in vain. Even though only 11 states have concluded the hearing, 18 are still you know, hearing um, all the cases brought by NSAS protesters. And a few other states like Kogi have not even 
everyone sat, even though there are those factors, I want to believe that they're not in vain. The fact that you know the National Executive Council will meet Professor Yemi Shimbajo would you know discuss this with state government, and they will find a way to end this menace. So two two things, you know, like he mentioned. The first one is uh, you know on funding. Uh, we have a 400 billion naira budget annually uh, for the police. Uh, do you expect that the Nigerian government will be able to push for a two trillion naira annual budget for for the you know, Nigerian police? We we'll can't, have to, we we have can't to afford start, it. So we'll start, start so the thing is, so the thing is, Nigeria can't even afford it as it stands, as as we currently um, are. We can't afford it. Um, do we have enough interest to say, okay, let's do you know seven hundred billion naira, eight hundred billion naira annually for the police? Auditing with police funds also, the four hundred billion naira, how much of it is actually released? Where does all this money go to? These are questions that need to be asked. All that auditing needs to get into into play here to understand why every single penny that is budgeted for the police every year um, hasn't gotten there. And then also um, with regards to state policing, um, do we expect that the Nigerian government will say, okay, well we accept? From the recommendations of this panel, we accept that we actually need to activate uh, state policing and you know change this current structure of policing in Nigeria. That's you know those are the, the two major I feel the two major aspects that a lot of Nigerians don't have faith that we will be able. To I actually. have faith. I believe we'll get there. It, it's it wouldn't happen overnight. Yeah, I want to sound like I have. I, I want to sound positive also. All right, let's take a faith. break here and we'll return to join a lawyer, Mr. Monde Obani, uh, to discuss jumbo salaries uh, for the National Assembly. Uh, do stay with us.